dealing with this subject because this is the heart and soul of Christianity, evangelism, and discipleship. The heart and soul of Christianity. So, uh, we can't know enough about discipleship what a disciple is because you are a disciple, I'm a disciple. And we need to know as much we can about discipleship. Okay, first of all, let's look at the statement, definition by Dr. Robert Coleman. Dr. Coleman says, a disciple who is a disciple, what is a disciple? A learner who's following Christ. And we're talking about Christian discipleship now because you have other types of disciples. Disciples, uh, discipleship that relates to other leaders, men. Socrates had his disciples. Uh, Plato had his disciples. And on and on. So we're talking about Christian discipleship. Christian discipleship. A learner who's following Christ. That's a disciple. You learn by following. And that means since we are finite and God alone is infinite, there's never a place in the journey where we stop learning. Understand that well. We are finite, limited. God is unlimited. And if we follow in Christ, there's never a time when we uh, have arrived. Never a time in the journey that we stop learning because you cannot exalt God. You can't exalt God. And so as long as we are on this side of eternity, we're going to be in the process of learning, or at least we should be in the process of learning. And you learn by following. When you follow him, this is very important because this is, again, the very essence of Christianity. We follow him, and as we follow him, we learn more of him. As we follow him, we learn more of him. We learn more about him. Uh, so then, our place is to, is to follow, and that means since we are finite and God alone is infinite, there's never a place in the journey where we stop learning how to have people who believe that they have arrived, at least they act like they know everything there is about God and, and, and the Christian life. Another man, a philosopher and professor, he says that a disciple is an individual who desires above all else to be like Christ. What is your desire? Do you desire above all else to be like Christ? That's important. Do you desire above all else to be like Christ? So an individual who desires above all else to be like Christ. Nothing is more important to that individual than being like Christ. They live to be like Christ. Their value, the value system that they operate under is based on, predicated on the principles of Christ. As they learn Christ, they formulate their value system. They determine uh, that they're going to respond to life and in the various situations in life, they're going to respond in a way that Christ would respond. That's what 
That's what they'll say. I want to be like Christ. I want to be like him in his relationship to God. I want to be like him in his attitude to God. I want to be like him in his uh, in the manner in which he dealt with the outcast. I want to be like him and respond to my enemies if, if you have enemies. And I want to respond to them like Christ responds. I want to be like him. And so the point of the question that they ask in many situations is when they're in a different situation and some, some situation can be really trying, uh, they, they ask the question, uh, what would Christ do? What would Christ have me to do? How would Christ handle this situation? Yeah, get on this side. <laughs> okay, so, so then you get, then they get over. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So they don't need to do them too. So, Dallas Willard, the philosopher and, and professor, said, and, uh, a disciple is an individual who desires above all else to be like Christ. That's their main concern. They want to be like Christ. And you're going to see uh, something relevant to this uh, in, in, the, in the lesson as we go uh, and proceed ahead. Uh, that's what you want. You want to be like Christ. You don't want to be like uh, uh, this one or that one. You might admire them, but you, your aim is not to be like them. Your aim is not to be like others. Your aim is to be like Christ. Christ is our barometer. Christ is the standard by which we must uh, measure our own life. As I say to you quite often, uh, you can uh, compare yourself. The thing about comparison, you can compare yourself with other people. But chances are, in making a comparison with other people, you're going to choose the, one, the, the weaker person to compare yourself with so you can come out of the comparison looking pretty good. You're always going to choose somebody to compare yourself with who's doing worse than you. But after we have passed the test against our fellow man, the question is, how do we fare off in a comparison when we compare ourselves with Christ? Our attitude, our action, the way we handle different situations. Our commitment to God. Jesus said, my father, love me because I do always those things that are pleasing in his sight. Do we seek to do all that we can to please God? Can we really say, as the song, if when we give the best, of, are we really giving the best of our service? That's a question that we have to answer for ourselves, not others. We live not to please others, we live to please God. And since we know that God knows our heart, then it behoove us to be honest with ourselves. And you can say I fail, you can say that uh, 
Come on, so you can say this is a problem that I have. You can say that without feeling guilty because, listen, I can't say it to you enough. The blood of Jesus, the death of Jesus, canceled out our guilt. God said, you don't have to feel guilt. Jesus' blood took care of everything. And it's hard for us to wrap our heads around that because we're so accustomed to people holding things against us. We can't, we look like we can forgive everybody but ourselves. And, and, and you know why we, we are like that and don't have high expectations from God? We don't have high expectations from God. Why like this? Now you got to get this. We don't have high expectations from God and feel that God is going to do that magnificent thing in our lives. We don't have that because we don't feel that we're worthy. How can a person like me have that kind of favor with God? I, 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 I can't, it looks like I'm taking God for granted. It looks like uh, I, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, coming to grip with the reality of my own sin and my own shortcomings. Friday night, how, how can you be so bold and how can you be so excited and anticipate God doing wonderful things for you, healing you, uh, 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 opening doors for you, giving you jobs? How can you do that when you know you're not all that you ought to be? So we don't feel, y'all understand what I'm saying? We don't feel deserving of God's blessing. That's why we are so slow to be bold and courageous. And the Bible plainly tells us, shows us that God has canceled out our total debt. Our debt is canceled. We don't owe anything. Jesus paid it all. God has canceled out guilt and whatever, all of that has been taken care of. God, you removed the guilt. So, uh, I got to get that to you, you know, because Christianity is not complicated in terms of understanding what the Bible says about the believer, what the Bible says about the Christian. If you just got to believe that and say about yourself what the Bible says about you. The Bible says nothing once I accept Christ and my Savior. The Bible does not say I'm guilty. Matter of fact, the Bible, the Bible does not say I'm condemned. The Bible actually says that what? I am uh, those, is there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Roman 8 and 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I'm not condemned. I can't be condemned. Well, what about your sin? What about your uh, failures? Well, I can't be condemned. And God had made provision for my inconsistency by giving and offering me the throne of grace. Watch this. God has made provision for the sin of the sinner. And you know what that provision is? The cross of Jesus. Jesus, God says, every sinner, if you're going to be saved, if you're going to be chained, if you're going to be my, my, my child and enter into the family of God, sinner, you have to stop by the cross. That's the first step. And there's no going uh, anywhere else. You can't go beyond the cross. That's your first stop. Now, once you stop at the cross, confess your sins, repent of your sins, then you become a child of God. The Spirit of God comes in to live in you. Now you are a Christian. You are a saint. saint. You are a saved one. So, God has provided a remedy for the sin of the sinner, the cross of Jesus. But after I accept Christ, and after I become a Christian, Lord, I still sin. I have provided a remedy for the sin of the believer. Where is it? Hebrews 4 and 19. Come boldly to the throne of grace. The sinner goes to the cross and get his life right with God. The saint, when he sins, he goes to the throne of grace. Not a throne of judgment. A throne of grace 
Why it's not a throne of judgment? Anybody can tell me? Why it's not a throne of judgment? Oh, hmm? Okay. Okay. It's not a throne of judgment because sin had been judged already at the cross. Christ has already judged sin. So it's a throne of grace. Grace, unmerited, what favor? Will you come to the throne of grace and receive what you don't deserve? Grace, for a mercy, is God not giving us what we deserve. He put that on Jesus. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. That ought to make you shout. Mercy is God not giving you what you deserve. You deserve hell. I deserve hell. God doesn't give us what we deserve. Mercy. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. I don't deserve to be representing God. I don't deserve to be uh, uh, um, to, to be blessed with the kind of blessing I have. I don't deserve that. But God grace. And so I don't have to feel guilty because of the fact that God has chosen to deal with his children by way of mercy and grace. God did that. Right? Okay, a good example. Uh, let's say all of us in here got, got, got a house, 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 house indebtedness. Yeah, uh, we were mortgaged on our house. And I choose, so wait. Okay, I'm going to take this, this sister here or this brother here. I am going to pay their mortgage off. Isn't that wonderful? They owe $25,000. I'm going to pay their mortgage off. You ain't got nothing to do with that. That's my money. I do what I want with my money. You can't say I did you any wrong because of the fact that that person there didn't deserve it. I just chose to bestow that blessing on that particular individual. So you can't get angry with the person and you can't get angry with God because none of us deserve to have our mortgage paid off by God. But God has chosen to pay our mortgage. I think I can't get it no plainer than that. God had chosen to wake you up this morning. God chose to wake you up this morning. God chose to uh, start you on your way. God chose to bless you in spite of your sins, in spite of your shortcomings, in spite of your failure. That's his grace. Giving you what you don't deserve. I don't deserve to be here. I want to be locked up somewhere. But God said, I'm not going to let that happen to me. So, so that's what I mean. An individual who desires above all else to be like Christ. Now, if a person does that for you, if a God does that for you, how much more should you want to be like Him? You want to please Him. You can't pay God. You can't repay Him. You can't do anything to add to God. God is complete. There's nothing we can do to enhance the value of God or the perfection of God. Nothing we can add. God is perfect. Totally perfect. There is nothing can be added to God. So why do we do good deeds? We do good deeds because we want to in all things say to the world and we want to say to God I thank you. I thank you for what you've done for me. I can't, I can't ever repay you, but I thank you. I just, this is my way of saying thank you. And so you use your gift of preaching, your gift of teaching, you use the gift of healing, you use the gift of, 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 uh, of administration, uh, you use the gift of health. All of these are uh, gifts that come from the Holy Spirit. And so then you use your gift to help others. But you use your gift. Well, who, first of all, who gives you the gift? Yeah, right. So 
whatever you have and whatever you can do is God's gift to you. Watch me now, you got to get it. Whatever you, God, you, you can do, whatever ability, and all of us have at least one gift in love, and then move beyond that. But whatever you can do, whatever you know, it's a gift that comes from God. That's God's gift to you. Why? How you use it is your gift to God. That make sense? Yeah. It's God's gift to you. What you can, well, he can preach a little bit. He can sing a little bit. That's God's gift to me, a God's gift to you. And how you use it, how I use it, becomes my gift to God. So the question is, are you using the gift that God has given you? You might be an encourager. You, just, uh, you might be a good listener. You listen, you know, that, that's it. You don't have to have to, all the answers. You don't have to make folk think that you are brilliant. Listen. And, 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 and as the Spirit moves you and you feel in your heart, you, you can say something that might help do it. That's what this is about. But then there's another definition that comes from Steve Morrow. What is a disciple, he said, and what is a disciple? It's following Jesus. It's fishing for people. And it's doing that in conjunction with others, in fellowship with, uh, with others. Doing, it, it's doing that in conjunction with others, in fellowship with others. Working together. That's what it's about. Okay, do we have any questions, any comment? Okay, let's look at the joint statement of discipleship that was formulated at the Eastbourne Consultation. That was a group that got together. Let's look at the statement. As we face the new millennium, we acknowledge that the state of the church is marked by growth without death. I want you to see this. Our zeal to go wider has not been matched by our commitment to go deeper. Concentrate on that a little bit. Concentrate that on a little bit. As we face a new millennium, we acknowledge that the state of the church is marked by growth, but it's growth without death. Our zeal to go wider has not been matched by our commitment to go deeper. Do you know what that means? That statement means? Somebody? Got an idea? Hmm? Quantity without quality? Okay. Right. You, you say something? Okay, somebody over here say something. Okay, say that again. A growth in numbers and not uh, a growth in a relationship with Christ. That's perfect. That's perfect. That's perfect. That's what it is. We've been saying today, it is so concerned about making members. Broaden itself out. We're going to fill all of them. We're going to fill these pews. But as we have concentrated on filling the pews, growing wider, we have not put emphasis on growing deeper. So true. And I will understand that we are pe many people who say, I, I accept Christ. Okay, you accept Christ. Are you growing in Christ? Are you becoming more and more like Christ? That's the, the, the problem with the church today. And that's, uh, again, the stuff I'm, going to, I'm giving you and we're giving you will reflect who we are in Christ, how God intended for Christianity to be viewed and to be followed, and uh, why we have to change and need to change the culture of the church because we're making more members 
but we're making, but we have few disciples. Well, we're accepting Christ. <clears throat> and transformation takes place for the accepting Christ. Transformation involves having a change of heart, the Spirit of God coming in us. But we haven't placed emphasis on deepening our understanding and our relationship and growing in that transformation. You follow? Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly what Transformation takes place as far as we, 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 we take an out of Christ, out of Adam, placed in Christ. But we're not growing in our knowledge and our understanding and in our practice. We're not growing in our faith and we're not growing in uh, our uh, 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 sanctification process. Well, I see a lot of people now, you accept Christ, I mean, you join the church, when, but there is no change in them. Yeah, well, that, that's exactly what we're saying. Yeah. They, accept, they accept Christ, there is no change in them, and, and, and it's not all their fault on time. There's no change in them because the church has a weak teaching program. And sometimes it's either a weak teaching program or no teaching program. They're so happy to have people to come and be a part of the church, and we got X amount of members. We got X amount of members. We pick up X amount of dollars, and they could seem to be content and satisfied with that, but there is no growth in that understanding and in that relationship. I say relationship, and there's no growth in that relationship with Christ, so that they're becoming more and more like Christ. They're acting more and more like Christ. The, you can see them, they're moving out of darkness into light, and they begin to let their light shine. You will see a little later. They begin to speak more about Christ. So the church has been guilty of putting forth effort to broaden itself, but not to deepen itself, where the, uh, the people, the members, are capable of sharing the gospel with those who are what? Those who are lost. So that's where the, where the problem is. So uh, in, in leadership, and I share with the brothers, is as a statement we use that says that uh, if Christianity, and if we're going to grow in faith, in our spiritual development, if we're going to grow in faith and develop spiritually, then some church, many churches, some church, they didn't say all. If we're going to grow in faith, one, and uh, spiritual development, too, then it's going to be necessary for the church, many churches, to change their program and take emphasis off of the program that, you know, not, not cut out all together, but take emphasis off of programs that seek to excite, seek to draw uh, uh, attendance, uh, increase attendance, and have to get back to what we're supposed to be doing. Every believer is supposed to be sharing their faith with the Lord. Every believer. And we're going to see that because we're going to get to it. It's, to, it's supposed to be a harbinger of the gospel. Jesus said, go into all the world. He's talking to every believer. Go into all the world. Not come here and try to be little theologians. We're not theologians. We leave that for the big boys there. And to show you we're not theologians, all I have to do is ask you one question. The next question is the psalm. What about the psalms? How are they categorized? How are they broken up? And you still have folks saying, I must preach, I must teach, I must read from the 25th division of the psalm. No such thing. The psalm has five divisions, and these psalms fall in a category. 
but not only do they have five divisions, those psalms are broken up, messianic psalms, uh, you, you've got praise psalms, you've got uh, syncretic psalms, you, you've got antithetical psalms. You don't know what that is. That's one thing. So you don't, don't try to be no scholar, not scholars. We've been given a plain, simple message, but it's a profound message. I don't have to know all these antithetical psalms and, and all of this con kind of uh, uh, song, retributive song and, and so forth. I don't have to know all of that. But what I do need to know is that Jesus died for sin. And any person, any sinner who comes to him and acknowledge their sins, he is saved. That, that's that you know you don't have to be a scholar that's what we do so Jesus said go into all the world here's the gospel he has believed in the baptized self shall be saved teach like this teaching them to observe all that I commanded you all that I commanded you and he didn't break up the psalm in all of that even though that was to come later and it's legitimate but he didn't uh, break up the psalms and all that. He taught that the psalms spoke of me. He talked about the Messianic psalm. Where was I wounded? I was wounded in the house of my friend, Messianic psalm. My God, my God, 22nd psalm. Why hast thou forsaken me? Messianic psalm. He talked about that. Oh Lord, let not my enemies prevail against me. It's a retributive psalm. And some had taken it to mean the psalmist wanted God to really just blast folks off the plate. No, whenever the psalmist asked God to, uh, to, to, to chastise, to destroy the unrighteous, it's because they have, the unrighteous have defied God, have shoved their finger in God's face, and so I don't care who you are, I don't care what you say, I'm not going to do this. And the psalmist said, no, let them get by with that. That's another word, I say retributive, that's another word for that. But just to, just to from, from, that, from that standpoint. So our problem is that a lot of time in the church, we try to come over like we're some scholars, we're not scholars. We're not, we're not, we're not scholars. We don't have to be scholars. You don't have to be a scholar to, to follow Christ. You don't have to be uh, one of the cream of the intellectual crops to follow Christ. What you need is a commitment, a heart that is committed and grateful for what all God has done for you. And you love him so much that you want to share the good news John 3, 16, what somebody called the gospel in a nutshell. You want to share the good news. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's the gospel. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace are you saved. By grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's the gospel. Romans 5 and 8, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what you tell us, sinner. With the heart man believe unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 9 and 10. That's what you tell them. That's what you tell them. Okay, so <clears throat> the church has to put emphasis on death and not simply on growth. God is, like this, God is more concerned with discipleship, following him. God is more concerned about men and women following him than he is about numbers. Numbers doesn't impress God. God is more concerned about faithfulness. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? God is more concerned about faithfulness than he is about 
numbers. God said, faithful. The Bible says, moreover, brethren, it's required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. God said, be faithful. You don't have to have 125 people following you. You don't have to have 200 people sitting at your feet. God is just as much concerned about one person as he is about 500 people. But he said, whatever your assignment is, I'm the one who gives the assignment. If I wanted you to have first day and 10,000 members, I, I would have given you that assignment. That's not my assignment perhaps for you. My assignment is first community and y'all, blah, 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 blah. So what my responsibility is, your responsibility is to be faithful. Be faithful to what I give you. Be faithful to what I place you on. Come on. Love the four, five, six hundred, whatever it is, just like you would love the, 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 the four thousand. Treat everybody the same. Don't have no pet. Don't have no friend to reward or enemy to punish. Come straight down the middle. Come on. Yeah. And he said to Jeremiah, I made you a, 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 a prophet. And, some, and, and I put my word in your mouth. And some going to receive it, some not. He said, but don't be confounded. Don't be fearful, so to speak, before them. Unless I confound you before them. If you're afraid of the people and afraid to tell the truth and you're worrying about what it's going to cost, folks going to leave and they're gonna, not going to put up money, he said, I'll deal with you. And I'll show you some things worse than that. You be faithful. Yes, sir. It doesn't matter who leave, who, um, who this and who that. If you be faithful, I'm going to reward your faithfulness. And I'm going to bless the people for doing what they're supposed to do. Okay, so what is this disciple? A disciple is one who engages in the Bible, Bible engagement. Bible engagement. Look at the paper. And I, I deliberately put more stuff on the paper because I want you to have it when you go home. You can look at it rather than have a lot of notes that I'm reading and saying to you that you don't have. I put much information on the paper so that you can uh, go back over it and Holy Spirit help me understand it to, to understand more and more. So a disciple is one who engages in the Bible. The, the Bible, watch this, the Bible describes believers as learners. The Bible says about believers, you are a learner. The Bible contains many commands like pursue truth, seek wisdom, Renew the mind. Learn from one another. Examine the scripture. In other words, the Bible encourages us to pursue truth. The Bible encourages us to pursue truth. Follow truth. Seek truth. Seek wisdom. The proper use of knowledge. Some folk got knowledge, but they don't know how to, how to relate that knowledge to practical living. Wisdom. The Bible said, renew the mind. Renew the mind. Whereas we used to think one way, in a selfish way, we used to think in a way that uh, uh, include us and nobody else. The Bible says, renew your mind. Learn how to think right. You read Philippians 4, 7 or 8, and find. They say that uh, it tells you about the renewing of the mind. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are this, whatsoever things are holy, whatsoever things are right. Think on these things. Think about good things. Think about right things. Think about godly things. Think about unselfish things. The temptation is there for us to 
and all they think in terms of how I'm going to get back. I'm not going to take the last word. If a person hit us with something, we don't have to answer right then and there. What happened is that we keep it in our mind, whatever it is, and uh, when we go home or whatever, throughout the, the day, the next day we formulate a response. And we're not going to let it go like that. So that when we see him the next time, we're going to tell him, oh, we'll bring that same matter up. You remember the other day you said so and so? I just won't say that. I was thinking about that. In other words, you got to get your jab in. Am I right? Yeah, because we don't take the last word. We don't want to take the last word. We got to win. Renew the mind. Think right. Think not about what you can get from others. Think about what you can give to others. Think not of how you can get other folks so much to support your position. Think of how you can support that position when that position is a good position. Think about how you can keep the peace. I'm preaching, y'all. Think about how you can keep the peace. You're not not winning all the men, but how you can display the, the attitude and the character of Christ. Think about that. That's what you think about. Rather than trying to make somebody miserable, trying to make somebody sad and trying to hurt them, think about what you can do to cheer up that brother or cheer up that sister. Even if it means you have to humbling yourself. Don't be so concerned about your own comfort and winning the argument. Be concerned about how you can help what? How you can help others. Jesus healed 10 leopards. Y'all remember that in the Bible? Jesus healed 10 leopards, and how many turn around and give him thanks? Only one. But did that stop him from healing them and doing them good? He didn't chase them tra- uh, down. To tell them, you know, he asked the question, where are the nine? Yeah. But he didn't chase them down and whoop up on them. They're all ungrateful sluts. I hear y'all, and look at that deadly disease. When you think about what leprosy was, a deadly disease. It isolated you from the community. You couldn't go in the public. Anybody come close to you, you had to cry out, unclean, unclean, I'm unclean. And yet Jesus healed them. It wasn't like they had a broken foot, uh, a, a sprained ankle. This was a serious thing that kept them from out of society, kept them from functioning in society. And so they should have been more grateful. Jesus said, to whom is given much, much is required. If he paid your debt off with $5,000, a $5,000 debt off for you, you ought to be glad. But the other fellow who he paid a fifty thousand debt all ought to be happier than you. And when you look at this, you think about just get off to yourself and think about how good the Lord been to you. When this man here, uh, when, uh, when the uh, mighty clouds of joy singing, if Jesus can't do it, nobody else can, and he called his preacher up to, to pray, and his preacher said, "We." Thank God, he said, we we can see with our eyes. We can hear with our ears. We thank God. You know, nobody got to feed us. We got the activities we can. Nobody got to watch over us because we lost our mind and we just suddenly to walk out in in, in the middle of the street. And kept you and given you five senses. Now, some people think they got ten. But he has given you five senses. He has given you uh, families. He, 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 he has not allowed uh, the, 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 uh, the justice system to come at you. 
In some cases, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. But in some cases, you got a ticket for breaking a law, and, and you allow somebody to fix it for you. I'm not going to say you had anything to do with that, but I'm simply saying that you've been a beneficiary of a whole lot of good, and you ought to thank God. The Bible says, learn from one another. It's bad when we get to a point where we feel that like we know it all and nobody can teach us nothing. The Bible says, examine the scriptures. I tell you all the time, you don't have to take my word for it. Look in the Bible. You don't have to depend on your own mind. Look in the Bible. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly punished unto all good works. It's my responsibility to preach the truth. Folks like to be exalted. Folks like to be instructed. But folks don't like to be rebuked. They don't like to be reproved. That's when they get in trouble. That's when they get into some trouble. That's when I get some attitudes even in this church here. You follow? As long as I'm instructed and as long as I'm exalted, that's okay. But when I have to deal with reproving and rebuking and whatever the case is, folk get attitude. You wouldn't have the slightest idea how far their mouth stick out. Stick out. Don't like the truth. Folks don't, don't want the truth. Folks don't like the truth. They, 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 they don't like to be reprimanded. They don't, they don't at least like to be, uh, they don't like to be uh, uh, placed on, as it says on uh, channel three, on the hot seat. Yeah. Folks don't like to look at themselves. They like to look at other folks. And they want you to look at other folks too. Yes, but they don't want to look at themselves. You know, we got a defense for everything that comes up. Everything that folks come bring and level against us, we got a defense, Linnell, for it. We got a defense. We never accept our own imperfection. He said, you know, I may not, I may be sending this signal. I don't mean to send it, but I may be inadvertently sending a, a negative signal. I might be, you know, my, my, my ways and my actions might be leading a person to a wrong conclusion. That's possible. But I want to justify myself so I defend myself and then I go get these other people and bring them in here and then I make a statement, tell me if I'm right or not. Well, automatically they know you want to say they, you're right. But you can, I make mistakes. You can make mistakes. All of us can make mistakes. The mark of a big person is not being able to try and defend and try to, to uh, justify uh, some questionable thing about themselves. The mark of a good person, a big person, is being able to objectively look at themselves, subjectively, too, and look at themselves and say, you know what? I know I don't mean it this way, but it's possible I'm acting in such a way that give the person and give people the wrong impression. So we want everybody else to change, but we don't want to change ourselves. Amen. I'm going to be, I've been like this, this is who I am. We need to change something if what we're doing is causing problems. Not so much for other folk, but cause problems for you. Your testimony is weakened. Your testimony is hindered when you can't identify with other people and if they say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it's possible that I'm sending the wrong thing. Okay? Okay, let's look at the statement. Based on what we said in, in, in number one, Bible engagement, the disciple. The statement is, we must commit ourselves to a lifestyle of learning. You must give yourself to a lifestyle of learning. Commit yourself to a lifestyle of learning. Well, Rev, you know, I've got to the point now where I can't see too well, and I'm you know, getting up in age. That shouldn't stop you. 
That shouldn't stop you from learning. If somebody asks you, do you want to die now, you're going to say no. Well, if you're going to stay here, you ought to try to learn as much as you can. And if you're true learning, don't want to learn nothing no more, then check out. <laughs> Nobody needs dead heads hanging around. <laughs> yeah. We ought to commit ourselves to a lifetime of learning. I don't care how many birthdays I make, if the Lord just keep me with, 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 with a relatively sharp mind, I'm, I'm satisfied. Yeah. As long as I can comprehend, I'm satisfied. Yeah, as long as I can expose myself to new ideas and to wiser people, shall it? Or people who are wiser than me and more knowledge than me, I can glean from them. I, I, yeah, I'm satisfied. I don't have to walk fast. I don't have to be able to run. But if I can learn, continue to learn, the quality of my life is not going to be determined by how fast I can walk and how fast I can run. The quality of my life is going to be determined by growth, intellectual, academic, spiritual growth. I want to keep learning. And I can't see, and I'm going to get into this. I can see how, for the world of it, how people can make claims to offices and make claims to position and don't bother themselves or commit themselves to learning. Under no circumstances. A doctor got to commit himself to learning. Huh? This assessor in New Orleans trying to straighten his mess out. He done up everybody property tax on the block and lowered his. <laughs> now, how crazy can you be? Yeah. Somebody going to look at that and say, now you're talking about some cra craziness. If you're going to up yours, uh, lower yours, give everybody a little piece of the pie. Maybe may not say nothing. Okay, so disciple, another thing about disciple, look at number two. Another thing about disciple, his life is characterized by obeying God and denying self. To be a disciple is synonymous with self-denial in favor of obedience to God. Ah, that's, that's heavy. That's heavy. That's important. That's very, very important. Listen. To be a disciple is synonymous with self-denial in favor of obedience to God. You don't have to stand on your rights, what you call it all the time. You don't have to prove that you're right all the time. You don't have to come out on top all the time. Think about the glory of God. How will God get glory from this? And God get glory from our lives when we are willing to surrender our rights, when we are willing to take a back seat when we are willing to put him first and his honor and his glory first, it's more important. I mean, it becomes more important to us. Am I coming through to you? Yes, it becomes more important to you that Christ be seen in his holiness and his um, majesty and in his righteousness and in his goodness that God be seen as a God of mercy and a God of grace. That ought to be more important to you than uh, defending your yeah, and being, uh, you know, uh, concerned more, mostly with how you look. Uh -huh. I, I, I've been using this example lately for a while. When Abraham, back before God called him, Abraham, that when Abraham uh, and, 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 uh, and Lot, Lot his nephew, and they were together, you know, in the same clan and all of this stuff. Abraham uh, was blessed with many servants and many flock. Lot, his nephew, was blessed with many servants and many flock. But then it got to a point where they began to feud. Yeah. Abraham and Lot, servant, began to feud. And Abraham said to Lot, 
let there be no strife between you and I. We blood. I'm the uncle. You're the nephew. This was the patriarchal age where the father and the elder had power of death over the son, over the younger one. And Abraham said, let that be no strife between you and I. Look over the plan. We're going to separate. But I'm going to give you a lot the opportunity to choose what piece of ground you want for you, your servant, and your flock. Yeah. And Lot looked out and spied the most fertile ground. Lot said, I'm going over here. Abraham said, so many words, I'll take what's left. Now, mind you now, Abraham did not have to do that. Yeah. Being Lot's uncle, Abraham had the right to choose first. Amen. But he relinquished that right. You don't see that today. He relinquished that right because he wanted peace. Yeah. And we ought to want the glory, the, the glory of God to be seen. Let the glory of, of the Lord be revealed. When I was in Gretna at a funeral at uh, one of those uh, other churches, let the glory of the Lord be revealed. Yes, I want to see the glory of the Lord. We ought to want God's name to flourish. We ought to want God's name to, 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 to be known. We ought to want the Christian way and the Christian life to be advanced to, to the point where we are willing and able, we are willing to give up our rights, so to speak. Is it, is it, that, imp is it that important that, that folks know that... Uh, you are, uh, you, 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 I don't know what, what I'm trying to say, but is it that important that people know that uh, you, you, uh, you bought five baby roots for six children or five children? Is that important? Is that important that you, you know, that you made, you the first one to make the statement that God was good? Is that, is that important? Give somebody get the credit for what? That's not the important thing. The important thing is that God be glorified. Right. I'm not going back and forth with you. If you say, uh, uh, Reverend Gann, it, it, it just get on my nerve. Well, I just get on your nerve. That's all there is to it. It doesn't take anything from me by you saying I get on your nerve. I might amen you because sometimes I get on my own nerve. <laughs> I might say, right on, sister. It ain't no big deal. Like the guy that work used to tell me, Kirk, when I wasn't at God, and I said, preacher, a white boy used to tell me, preacher, he said, 100 years from now, nobody gonna know the difference anyway. Right. So what? I don't have to sing my own song, tune. I don't have to sing my own song. God knows what I'm doing. Yeah. And I tell you another thing, that would be people who know what you're doing too. Everybody not two-faced, everybody not hypocritical. There are folks who are honest. There are people who appreciate you for who you are. You don't have to get out of your own skin to try and be somebody else. Be who you are and be content and satisfied. Yeah. So then when you look at this thing, the glory of God and the honor of God should be more important than anything else. And to be a disciple is synonymous with self-denial. Deny yourself. You don't have to have your way all the time. We must be God-focused rather than self-focused. We got to be God-focused rather than self-focused. Don't focus on yourself. Don't focus on what you can get. Don't blow your own horn. Toot your own horn. You do good, do good, and leave it up to God. You don't have to go around singing to the world and telling the world what you did. Oh, well, she was in destitute, and uh, I, I, uh, I, I bail out. Yeah, I got a call from, uh, did you hear about someone? So she falling on a hard time. Oh, yeah, I heard about her. Matter of fact, she called me the other day and asked me to pray for her. Between you and her. 
Stop trying to make yourself more religious than everybody else. And another thing about disciples, you'll be serving God and others. It's on the back of your page. Serving God and others. The concept of service is vividly portrayed throughout the Bible. The concept of serving is vividly portrayed throughout the Bible. Jesus is our example of what it means to be a servant. He served. He helped people. And his service was done indiscriminately. He didn't discriminate. He wasn't about serving the rich and ignoring the poor. He wasn't about doing good simply to those who had much and were influential. He served the high and the low. He served the good and the bad because he was about service. And so then, if you want to be a disciple of Christ, serve. We live in a day now when folk want to be served. Want that name called. Want the seat on the, on the platform. Want to be recognized. Serve. Give yourself to serve. Four, share Christ. Talk about your faith to unbelievers and the unchurch. Talk about uh, singles folks out. You got family members. They don't know Christ. You got family members who once was in church and they're not in church. Single them out. Pray for them. Single them out in your prayer. And you pray for them. And then you talk with them. Ask God to lead you to the proper time to talk with them and to share with them. You got friends. Share the gospel with them. Share what the Lord has done for you. You don't have to be a scholar. But God has done something for you that you can share with others. People are not looking for scholars. They're looking to be helped. Folk want to be helped. Invite them to church with you. We must have an outward focus. Invite them to church with you. You might have, uh, and then if they don't want to come to church, you might can ask them uh, to, if it's okay with them, that you call them every now and then and just share a word of Christ with them. You'd be surprised what kind of response. Somebody said the world is just waiting to receive an invitation. Some people are waiting to receive an invitation. Then exercise faith. A disciple is marked by a posture of weakness. You say I'm weak. But such weakness creates a great opportunity to exercise faith in a strong God. Your weakness can benefit you and can motivate you to rely on and lean on the God who is all powerful. So don't let your weakness stop you from being involved in church activities or in ministry. Let your weakness drive you more and more to Christ and enable you to lean more and more on him, to trust him more and more, to cry out to him, Lord, take my life, make me usable, draw me nearer to you, give me the faith and the courage. You did say to Joshua, be thou courageous, don't be fearful, make me uh, courageous so that I can serve you. That makes sense? Yeah. Throughout the Bible, the Christian experience is described using words like believe, trust, rely upon, and act upon. Believe God. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Learn how to trust God. Father, deepen my trust in you. Help me to come to a point where I rely totally on you. 
Help me to act upon you, to go out in your name. Help, help me to, 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 to take that necessary step. Suffer me not to move until I see the result or see the end, until I feel that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. Help me to step out on your word. You see, all of this, you can learn how to, how to, how to increase your prayer life. Then you have to seek God. A disciple is one who seek after and worship God. A true disciple, a follower of Christ, is to engage in a lifestyle of worship, both privately and corporately. We come here together and we worship, but then you ought to have quiet moments at your house, on your job, in your car, privately, where you just praise God and worship God and thank God for his goodness in your life and ask him to deepen your fellowship, deepen your walk with him. So you got to seek God. It's about building relationships. We must intentionally seek to be related to one another, especially the community of faith. The Christian life is not a solo sport where you play it all by yourself. Neither is it a spectator sport where you stand on the sideline or in the grandstand and watch other people play. It's about involvement. We cannot and must not live in isolation from the body of Christ. We need one another. We must encourage one another. We must strengthen one another. We must be there for one another. It's not the time to act or criticize one another. It is time to encourage one another. Certainly your brother is not perfect, but you're not perfect either. Certainly your brother has some mishaps, but you have them too. I have them. And so we're going to get more done if we help one another than if we use words and actions that hurt one another. This is what the Christian, what I'm giving you is what the Christian life is all about. And then be unashamed. Transparency. Let people know whose side you're on. The disciple is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should be willing to talk openly about our walk with God. We naturally praise and talk about what we love. We talk about what we love. We hear so much. Every time you turn the television on or whatever it is, we hear so much about uh, we hear so much about football season. Football season never was out since the Super Bowl. Football season still been going on. Folk been talking about it. And what I know this time and what uh, captures my attention is uh, was at night on Channel 9 was that uh, at the end of the, the broadcast, the sports show, uh, they got the high school boys on. And they have the coaches. And then they put the mic in the hand of one of the high school players. And, and uh, they talk about, they, got, they learn football language. And they talk about what the team has to do in order to win a championship, in order to, to play effectively. It's all in the blood, all in it. You get my point? And the thing that struck me, Craig, was that this was a team that last year went two wins and nine losses. And they're talking about championship and all that. Everybody want to win a, a championship. And, and so then it has become, I brought something, and, and give me five minutes and I'll give it to you. I brought something that kind of uh, help us put things in perspective and trying to help us to understand where we are this day in this secular culture. You follow? What is the problem? What is the problem with, 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 with this, this society of ours? Why are we having the kind of trouble and so forth? Listen to me. I'm going to go over it right quick. A study done some time back 
20% of high school kids have contemplated suicide over the past year. 8% said they attempted suicide in the same time period. 12% of kids are lonely. 25% feel unfulfilling life. Nearly 50% say they are stressed out. Many kids struggle with depression, feeling of loneliness and rejection. According to many youth culture experts, relational deprivation, that they're deprived of relationship. Relational deprivation is one of the primary characteristics of younger generation today. Dr. Chuck Clark, in his book, Hurt Inside, Hurt Inside the World of Today's Teenager. Even our best kids have been deeply influenced by our non-relational, fast-paced, secular culture. In other words, we're living in a time and in a world and in our society. Don't place emphasis on togetherness, corporate culture. <coughs> Everything is about me, what we call the me generation. Just spend a little time with young people and you will see firsthand the emptiness that haunts so many of them. From an early age, they imbibe the cultural message that life is a pitiless pursuit of individual gratification and success, requiring extraordinary good looks, money, and moral compromise. They tend to lack any sense of contact, how to live together, community, and live for a higher purpose. It's all about me. This is what our culture has done, people. It's about me, it's about me, me, me. It is hardly surprising that so many of them are taking antidepressant, attention def deficit disorder, medication, or other pills. Many more hide their sadness in eating disorder, alcohol, or meaningless sexual hookups. In a rush to provide this, this is what will happen. In a rush to provide our young people with everything, we have forgotten to answer a basic question, what is life for? That's why we talk about changing the culture. That's why so many uh, uh, religious organization and so many aligned uh, uh, religious scholars and so in the churches, many of them have come to realize that something has to be done. One raised the question, you either change or you die. The churches must either change or risk the chance of, of dying and becoming extinct. I see. Well, when you look at it, dying, everything that's dead is not buried. That's some walking dead. That's some walking dead. Well, wherever the group exists, the building exists, nothing significant is taking place. People, we ain't gonna save the world, but at least I want you to be aware of what is taking place. Young people, uh, 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 they, 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 they're clueless as to what life is all about. Jamal Bryan said, in our pursuit of making money, we have lost our young people and lost our generation. Because all it's about me. All about me, all about me. So, from that perspective, we need to think in terms of what can we do to reach our young people and reach others with the gospel because the gospel is the only thing that can save. The gospel is the only thing that can give meaning to life. It's the gospel that's gonna find fulfillment. They won't find happiness in all these other things. The only way a person can find true happiness, tranquil, uh, serenity, tranquility, is following the way of God. And we can't allow Satan and nobody else, well-meaning people, to cause us to shift our focus and change our focus 
from the divine mandate in favor of. That's an opening statement for some of you, Camden. We have put a lot of emphasis on spreading ourselves wide at the express of not growing deep. We're more concerned about members than making members than making disciples. So in the process of making members, we want to make disciples too, followers of Christ. Amen? Amen. That's my message to y'all today. Amen. So as we stand all over this place, we're grateful to Almighty God for the opportunity to, to worship him. And y'all thank God for this day, for this day of enlightenment that he has called us this day and has given us understanding as to what we need to do to get back on track or to continue on track and to follow him in in the way that he intended ministry to be done. There may be one you're present of who can come and share. If not, let us join our hands together. Father, we thank you so much for your love, your grace, your mercy, and your goodness. Thank you, dear God, for saving us, keeping us safe. We thank you for blessing us with knowledge and understanding of your way. We thank you, Father, for using us for the glory of God and for the building of your kingdom. Pray that we would just continue to follow you. Believe, trust, lean on you, and know, dear God, that your word will never come back void. So we thank you. I thank you for these, your people. I thank you for their commitment, for their faithfulness. Give them the strength that they need to endure hardness as a good soldier. Help them to understand, dear God, that no matter how it looks, how it feels, that you have not abandoned them. You have not forsaken them. And let them know, dear God, if they continue to trust and, and wait on you, that you will make it all right in due season. Trust. We want to trust you with all of our heart. And lean not to our own understanding. Help us to acknowledge you in all of our ways and just let you direct our path. So we thank you. Thank you, Father. Now, dear God, as we enter into another football season, we realize that our children are going to be back and forth at the stadium and up and down the highway. We realize that temptation is going to be there. We ask that you would watch over them, that you would keep them. We ask that they would make the right decisions. And that, Father, you would not yield to the tempter's voice and to the tempter's uh, strategy to get them to abandon what they have been taught. So, Father, we ask your protection upon our children. We ask your protection upon the players and keep them from uh, sustaining serious injuries. We need your help. Only you can do it. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 God bless you when you come and give if you so desire. <laughs>